So uh, our speaker today is Mitch Erickson. I believe he's the incoming president of the Old Guard. Um, but as to uh, his topic, which will be technology and uh, our future, the future of technology in the post-COVID environment. And Mitch was a senior executive uh, until he retired in 2008 um, from uh, in science and technology at University, I'm sorry, U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Um, he assessed emerging technologies such as autonomous vehicles, artificial intelligence, human identification, and more with respect to opportunities for us to prevent the bad guys, uh, including Mother Nature, from doing bad things. He uh, spent the first uh, three quarters of his career conducting research on environmental and analytical chemistry, notably in on environmental issues associated with uh, PBCs. Uh, those are pretty bad uh, uh, things that found their way into the environment through uh, generally manufacturing processes. He's published extensively. He also consults. Uh, holds a PhD uh, from University of Iowa, also worked at Argonne National Labs, U.S. Department of Energy, and as I said, is retired from the Department of Homeland Security. So uh, with that, we are anxiously awaiting to hear your presentation. Okay, first of all, uh, does everybody see a white screen with a funny looking blob in the upper right hand corner? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, your audio is not very good. Mitch, could you do something about your audio? We're there it is. I, I had moved the boom microphone out of the way. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> Technology. What can I, what can I say? Uh, just one quick request. Uh, correction, Jim, I, I, I retired in 2018, not 20, 2008. I've just been retired about a year and a half. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys today about uh, the technology aspects of what our post-COVID world looks like. And um, so I'm going to dive in. Uh, one of you is, you know, throw a, red, throw a red flag if I go on too long because, you know, I can talk about this for like hours. And so when you're, when you're tired, let me know. What, what, when should I start aim, aim, to, aim to quit talking? Like, uh, we usually speak about uh, uh, 30 minutes, okay. a little less, with an opportunity for some Q&A. Okay, well, yeah, and you guys be ready for Q&A because I'll, I'll leave some time at the end for discussion. So this is all part of what I wrote a, a, an article on, and I've actually written a couple of subsequent articles, and I can certainly... Uh, email those to you uh, afterwards and um, so what we're going to do is talk a little bit about where we are right now and then our, our tech future uh, in sustaining our world, moving people and stuff, how we innovate and then at the end just something that I like to talk about, uh, life is worth living because you know if life's not worth living what the hell are we doing? Um, so and we will have some discussion. Uh, so uh, in April, the end of April, we were seeing obituaries in the Star Ledger like that. And we all, don't try and read this, just we all lost uh, uh, friends, uh, relatives, et cetera, through the COVID. And we lost some beloved uh, stores. That's the Summit Cheese Shop, which is uh, blessedly open up again under uh, new management. And we lost uh, some big chain stores. And we lost, uh, oh, and, and then uh, this is, this is kind of ancient history now, but Remember the uh, huge lines for people to get uh, uh, food bank, uh, and this is down in Egg Park, but this is, people were in line for hours just to get the, the food from the food bank. And we're still suffering in many, many different ways. Um, and here's a picture of uh, the airport um, and, uh, you know, nobody there. And we're slowly coming back to traveling, but not, by, not like we were, uh, say, last January, February. So, as we sit here at home, all in our little cocoons, um, I maintain that when we get out of this, there will be a new normal. I further maintain that uh, we'll have some new technologies. 
And we've already been doing some things, uh, the innovative face shields, the partitions that we've been doing to, you know, socially distance uh, and a lot more. Um, but I think at the end, we're going to be stronger, more resilient and more livable. So let's just talk about indoors. We're all indoors and our indoor air is about two to five times more polluted than the outdoor air, uh, unless you're in in downwind of the fires in the out west. Um, but you know, we spend 90% of our times indoors and it's important to understand what our in indoor environment looks like. And so you, uh, the pollutants that might be in, in our indoor coming from the right are ozone, carbon dioxide, um, household odors, formaldehyde, off-gassing from some in insulation kind of materials and, and glues, and finally airborne particulates. In particular, airborne particulates are um, what we've been guarding against here in, in, in the COVID times. And there's sort of a notion that if you're staying two, two meters away for two six, or six feet away from somebody, you're okay. But don't forget that, you know, the wind can be blowing and uh, extend that uh, distance quite a bit. So we're, we're uh, on the fly figuring out a lot about uh, uh, the movement of uh, particulates in air, the aerosols and the droplets have uh, come from us talking and sneezing. Um, and so as we've gone along, uh, we've had hospitals that have uh, retrofitted. Uh, I know in particular over, over, Overlook did this. They retrofitted their air handling so that they could better control uh, the air exposure and, and reduce the, uh, the risk. And so there are drawings and architects and uh, HVAC designers and stuff that figure out how best to do uh, the uh, air flows. And of course, the commercial people, Johnson Controls, which is a, a big, uh, big, big con company in the world of uh, thermostats and things like that. And they have all sorts of different controllers and valves and uh, intakes and sensors in order to uh, create a sanitized uh, uh, um, uh, hospital room. And one, one thing that came out of Overlook, which I thought was just absolutely outstanding and, 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 and I know this is not unique to Overlook, but the typical hospital room has the patient's bed next to it are all of the IV bags and the monitors and the things that go beep, beep, beep and have red lights going like this at you. And what they've done is they've taken all of those and they've added longer cables, put them out in the hallway and then run them through a, a four inch hole in the, in the wall so that when uh, a nurse or a doctor needs to read the vital signs or change the, the settings for the IV drip or whatever, they can do that in the hall without having to go into the patient's room, don gowns, wash up, do their thing, come out, doff the gowns and, and go on and do other things. So, you know, that's the kind of things that we've seen and that, that's all just kind of ad hoc stuff. So, so air is a big deal. Uh, it's a big deal and we, we uh, you know, wear our masks um, and uh, we're gonna get smarter about all that stuff. Um, I wanna talk a little bit now about moving people and stuff. First, moving people. Autonomous vehicles are getting closer. Uh, I'm not going to predict uh, how many more years before we finally have full autonomous vehicles. And a fully autonomous vehicle is de defined as something where there's no steering wheel, no pedals, and nobody, no human, you know, even a safety driver. Um, and so once we get to that point, uh, a lot of things are going to change. There will probably be fleet ownership, so you won't own your car. There will be owned by somebody that owns millions of cars and we'll have more ride sharing um you know we don't think twice about ride sharing in an elevator um but yet we we are not very comfortable about ride sharing with uh regular cars and right now we're concerned about uh you know contamination from an uber driver or the, the prior uh prior passenger in a in a in a uber kind of a vehicle or so those are the kinds of things that we will be seeing changed somehow. Um, and, you know, other things we're going to see changed is uh, hopefully uh, a little bit better traffic management. There's, there's the turnpike, and I assume this is a Friday afternoon in summer. Last year, when everybody was headed down the shore all the same time, 
and out in front of Grand Central Station, you guys all know this one, the interminable lines just to get a taxi. And, uh, you know, why? I mean, there's, there's got to be better ways. And, of course, Uber and Lyft have uh, revolutionized our, our, uh, our, our riding experiences in a lot of different ways in the last decade or so. Now, moving stuff, okay? Uh, we have a distribution in the supply chain. Uh, during the early days of, of the uh, COVID, the, uh, the medical supply chain was, was strained and even broken. I mean, they're just things that weren't moving in the right direction. Uh, we've moved, moved towards grocery delivery. A lot of us are doing that. And uh, drone deliveries are being tested out now by the major uh, distribution people, Amazon and so forth. And there are novel vehicles. And let me show you a couple of examples. Well, first, let me just talk about grocery delivery. So here's, a, here's, here's somebody that will let you pick up wine. And then here's the, the, the over here on the right is the uh, popular thing where they put the groceries in your car and you never have to get out uh, and go in the grocery store. You, they just put your order in the car. And of course, uh, you know, th this is the goal, you know, is to stay home and let them deliver whatever it is that you order. And so we're, we're a lot of us are changing in that direction. And also in terms of deliveries and freight, here's a little uh, thing called the Starship. And it's, you know, about the size of a picnic cooler, but it's automated. And they're testing it in uh, Arlington, Virginia, and Mountain View, California, and a couple of college campuses. I think this is in Virginia. But this guy can scoot around, doesn't go very fast, but it gets you your stuff, whatever it is, if it fits in that size of a vehicle. Uh, the vehicle on the right is a test vehicle. You can see all of the stuff on the, up on the top there. And this is a, an autonomous company that is testing between uh, LA and Phoenix, where there's no driver involved in, in uh, moving the, a big freight thing. And of course, people like Elon Musk and Tesla are all over this, and we will probably see autonomous long haul freight before we see autonomous uh, human passenger vehicles because the economics are so big to take a driver that costs maybe a hundred thousand dollars a year and you know adding thirty thousand dollars of autonomous electronics is not a big deal in a six hundred thousand uh, dollar tractor there so that's kind of the way we're seeing uh, some of the things moving we will see more of that uh, and you can imagine a, a future where uh, you don't own a vehicle and you don't drive and our kids may not even have driver's licenses, our grandkids. Um, robots are a big deal, robot deliveries. This is the kind of thing that goes on in warehouses. The yellow things are all stacks of uh, bins of, of, of merchandise. And the orange thing down at the bottom is a robot. It comes underneath and it picks up that rack and moves it to a, a place where then the uh, humans pick things out of the rack and put them in the box and eventually it comes to your front porch. Uh, coming soon to you is uh, some kind of a drone. This is a, a few months old uh, vision of the way that Amazon was going to deliver things. Um, a lot of different ways that they're thinking about the, uh, the, the final de delivery to you, including a, a notion where uh, you'll put out a, a, a target on, say, on your back patio or something, and it will then know to come down to that target um, and, and leave your package. So this is, this is also something that's being experimented on, and uh, we'll get there sooner or later because we're trying to take the humans out of these, uh, these jobs that are not only, uh, and, and just a quick note on robotics, uh, going all the way back to the 50s and Isaac Asimov, the uh, definition of the place where you want robots is jobs that are dirty, dangerous, or dull. And picking uh, uh, stuff off of the rack and putting in a box is pretty, pretty dull. Uh, driving around in a, in a, a delivery van is, is, is fairly dull. And a lot of the things that, that we're seeing in, well, I'll go to the next one. And how about a robot to, uh, to splash UV light all over your airplane to kill all the, the bugs? Now, that's dangerous because humans can't be in the same uh, spot when you turn the UV light on or you'll get the world's worst sunburn. And, uh, 
and so this is another robotic thing that that's trying to uh, decontaminate uh, airplanes and, and similarly you know buses and hospital rooms they're, they're using ultra it's called UVC the C band of ultraviolet um, and so uh, those are kinds of things in the future that will sanitize our environment um, and one of the things is that in a crises we see a lot of innovation and this is a crisis and we're seeing innovation and if you go back uh, remember the Manhattan Project and the atomic bomb the radar the code breaking all of those things that a lot of electronics that came out of, of World War II and, and the uh, Manhattan Project and of course one of the things that that was was spurred through through the uh, through that period of technical innovation in the 50s and 60s was our, our old friend Bell Labs up here in the upper right hand corner and the, the thing that's a little different now in the 21st century is we're seeing mm -hmm. American companies like Intel moving over into Europe with their R&D and we're seeing Chinese companies like Baidu setting up R&D centers in in uh, Silicon Valley so we're seeing a, a more global uh, R&D thing, but the crisis of COVID is going to spur a lot of technology advances and not just in uh, vaccines and medicine, which, by the way, I'm not going to talk too much about because it's not an area I'm really uh, too familiar with. And, and you know, you may have may have never focused on this, but our technology world has been, you know, growing rapidly. Somewhere around 2400 BC, somebody came up with the abacus, and that was the big technology there. And then you come along through, and you see microphone, microscopes, and telephones, and cars, and TV, and radio, and buildings, and so forth. The technology world is is advancing, in accelerating all the time. Uh, one might say an exponential growth, but the the uh, the world that we're in is significantly different than the world we were in even at the turn of the century. And I, I rest my case with this little guy right here um, that has changed so much of what we do, the way we think about the world, the way we communicate, the way our kids communicate, um, texting, um, you know, the iPhone, this happens to be an iPhone, the iPhone's only a decade old and it's just you can't live without one now. In fact, I left some to go somewhere this morning and uh, I got about 100 yards down the road and said, where's my phone? I turn around, go back, grab my phone, and then get back in the car. Um, so accelerating growth of technology. And I'm going to talk a little bit about life is worth living. The notion is we do a lot of stuff in order to make money. We do a lot of stuff in order to uh, develop a career. But at the end of the day, you know, the proverbial five o'clock, which used to mean something, at the end of the day, uh, we need life that is worth living. Well, what does that mean? We, you know, entertainment, uh, social events, uh, reading a book, going to a football game, whatever it is that, that you like to do in your, uh, in your time where you live and nobody tells you what you have to do. So what do we got going on now? Well, uh, we got baseball in front of empty seats. We got, uh, um, you know, orchestras doing things on Zoom. And by the way, this is absolute, not, not as trivial as, as it looks. Um, the way they do these things is actually kind of fascinating. They, they, they lay down a, a soundtrack, kind of a karaoke kind of thing. And they, each individual player plays their own thing and, and, and contributes it. And then someone in in post processing has to line all of these things up, and not only line up their start point, but also through the whole uh, piece because some people's things slow down and some people speed up. It's not a trivial thing. You cannot just have an orchestra on with 20 cameras and start playing. It will sound like bedlam because uh, everybody's just a little bit out of phase with all of the uh, time delays that go on between, say here and Korea. So um, so that's some of the things that are going on. We're, we're adapting and we're adopting and we're, we're doing things that are still fun. Um, and we're also doing things to keep clean. Uh, and I'm gonna take a little bit 
through the bathroom world. Um, the, the upper right hand corner, you know, touchless faucets, we've all seen those in, in public bathrooms. Um, and now there's a, you know, there's remote controlled showers and, and this woman's getting ready to turn her shower on. And I, I, I pulled this off of the internet somewhere. Well, why in the heck does she have to touch it? Because that, that, that controller could easily be set up with Bluetooth to be, um, you know, talk to just like you talk to Alexa or Siri or whoever. And uh, then, of course, there's the, uh, the advanced toilets here. That This is a Toto, T-O-T-O -T -O, from Japan, and the, uh, the advanced toilets. And so, you know, sanitation is, is moving along. Um, and by the way, just as a quick aside, uh, this is all in the, in the first world. Third world, still a third of, of the world's population is water uh, challenged. And by, by water challenged, I mean either they can't get pure water to drink and cook and so forth, or they can't get rid of the water with decent sanitation, or they don't have a, a, a decent place to defecate. You know, a third of the world doesn't have one of, one of those three, and a lot of them don't have any of them. So, I mean, we're talking people that walk miles just to get a, a jug of water and carry it home. But the first world, is what I'm looking at here. And this is our lives here in, in Summit and Mountainside and wherever else we live. Um, but, you know, again, we're getting more sanitary, more, uh, more cleaner. And we're getting also, aside from COVID, we're also realizing that the, the world is, is a, uh, a much, uh, much more complicated. Our bodies are much more complicated. We're carrying a hundred trillion microbes in and on us. They're all over us. And there's a different colony behind your ears than on your shoulder. Um, it's very complicated and we need them. We cannot live without our microbes. Um, so uh, stay tuned for further developments on that topic as the world gets a little bit um, more, from the scientists get a little bit more familiar with what's going on there and, um, and how that interacts with our, our our use of uh, beauty care products, how that interacts with disease, how that, a bunch of things. Anyway, that's an aside. Uh, so back to COVID, uh, you, here's a couple of different, um, uh, different pictures. Here's uh, uh, Father Bill at Our Lady of Peace in New Providence. Uh, I don't think he was that angry. I think it's just the way the screen capture caught him. And then here's a, a drive-in church with a minister uh, up on a scissor jack, uh, platform uh, preaching. So we've, we've adapted and we've adapted to remote uh, attendance at, at each church. Um, we've, uh, uh, let's see if I can find Mort in this. This is the old guard. Uh, there's Mort right there. And so, uh, you know, we've adapted and adopted and you guys have adapted and adopted to using uh, Zoom and other kinds of things. And, you know, this is pretty cool. But it's not the be all end all. And, you know, five, 10 years down the road, we'll look at this and say, this was really quaint. These people did this with these little tiles. And so one example of, of a, a, a better way of doing it is here's a, uh, a group of people say in Summit and another group of people say in San Francisco, and they're having a virtual meeting. And now they have you know, cameras that zoom in on the individuals, you get the, the decent, you get really good uh, sound because it's all microphones are built in the ceiling. Um, and this isn't even the future future. This is just what's currently available. Uh, if you want to spend a lot more money than we individually were going to spend. Um, but, you know, th this is the world that's coming. Uh, distance learning, distance working, working from home. You guys all know the numbers. And the technology behind it is critical for us to have a, a good thing. I want to also mention that the technologies are going to impact on uh, the way our social structure. I just mentioned the third world. And we've had a big uh, thing with Black Lives Matter uh, since, uh, uh, I guess it was May. And uh, in, in the COVID world, a couple of things. First of all, us old, fo us old folks, die a lot more than the young folks do in terms of, of the COVID. Um, and, uh, and the COVID is also um, 
has some racial implications. Uh, blacks and Latinos are much more uh, likely to get infected. This is infections, not deaths, uh, than whites. Um, and why that is the subject for a whole nother, well, mostly for me, at least speculation. Uh, but these are the kinds of things where we need to democrat democratize our living. Um, so I'm kind of wrapping up now, <clears throat> but uh, my, my thesis is life is worth living. Um, you know, we've changed, we'll have an abrupt change in our technology trajectory and all of these different things, you know, education will never go back to the old way. Uh, even if we go back to in person, we're going to have a lot of lessons learned and we sure as hell should be, uh, on, on better ways to deliver the educational, uh, curriculum. Uh, same with work, um, same with communication. Not, I didn't even touch on knowledge management, but that's a whole nother world with AI and so forth. Um, and how do we get together and say, stay safe? Well, there's all sorts of uh, work from home options. Uh, I've got kids that don't think they're ever going to go back to their midtown o Manhattan offices. Just to be clear, my kids. Um, and uh, We'll have other issues going on, and we're still we're seeing things like these motorcycle rallies and so forth, where hundreds of thousands of people are all getting together with no mask, and people are going, "What's going on there?" So a lot going on in terms of the way we can live and still be safe, and um, you know we have new habits, and so we're going to demand new chain, new technologies, and the the entrepreneurs, the smart scientists, the uh, engineers, people will develop and, and market these technologies to meet our demands. Um, and uh, here's a whole lot of words, but basically, um, you know, like, like with the Manhattan Project and all those things in World War II, uh, we're going to see major changes in, in how we learn, what we learn, how we store and retrieve data. Um, and how this all folds out, I'm not going to sit here and crystal ball for you guys. But, you know, we'll watch it and it'll be an interesting ride. Uh, and just to go back to something I said at the very beginning, just to remind you, um, we got a new normal, um, novel technologies, uh, partitions, face shields, et cetera, have been there. And at the end of the day, our, our, our society will be stronger, more resilient, and more livable uh, once we get out of this. And that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Uh, happy to do uh, any any Q and A. Um, you know, there's a lot to talk about. Like I said, I cut it out because I think pretty much people know about the issues of the of the, the vaccine the, the, uh, or the the various vaccine issues. People also know about how we need to get better PPE and little flimsy cloth face masks like this may or may not uh, be the best way to go about life, and certainly. Um, back to say Giants games. Um, how are you supposed to drink a beer with one of these guys on? Uh, so with that, questions. Yeah, David. Hey. Let's draw. <laughs> hey, uh, Mitch, thank you for such a great presentation. And of course, your topic. You, we could spend hours talking about this, but but one thing that that came to mind here is. You know, back in the 50s and 60s, there was the space race, and it was, you know, Russia versus the United States, uh, which country was going to do it. Um, in more recent years, of course, all the focus is on Silicon Valley and what the private sector has developed. Now we have this challenge with COVID-19, and I'm not sure the private sector is taking the lead, or at least a lot of people are saying we need more leadership from government. What's your view is who's going to take us to the next level? Is it the private sector, the public sector? What's the proper role for each of those? Thank you. Okay, well, um, you're right, David. I got another couple 300 slides I could throw at you guys and keep you here till midnight. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the old issue of government versus uh, industry. Um, I showed a slide of Bell Labs. I, I, uh, uh, Jim mentioned in his introduction that I was at Argonne National Lab out in, in Chicago, and uh, so I know I know I know from working for the government as a scientist. Um, what I'm seeing, and again, I'm not paying a lot of attention, but what I'm seeing is a government to 
private sector partnership here, the, co the public private partnership, PPP, um, which is, uh, is going down where the government is paying uh, these vaccine companies up front to build the man manufacturing capacity so that when, when the science actually says this vaccine works, uh, that then they can ramp right into, uh, into manufacturing. Um, the, the classic thing with, with and, and we'll stay with uh, drugs for a minute, the classic thing with drugs is, is that if, if, there's a, if there's something like, oh, say, heart disease uh, that a lot, a lot of people have, and particularly a lot, a lot of uh, first world people, first world country people, um, there's money to be made. So the private sector goes off and does that. And then there's a class of orphan drugs, and these are ones that uh, uh, treat, you know, uh, diseases that maybe have a few thousand worldwide every year, that kind of stuff. And government tends to take up on those things. The actual government um, private sector boundary, uh, first of all, it's different in every country. And, you know, of course, in, in China, you know, it's a whole different world in terms of, of who's who and, and what's what with the government versus the private sector but in, in in america and say say europe the the issues are are pretty much that you know we've we've evolved a a an ecosystem of science i'm going to stay with science and technology and the uh, uh it's it's a we got a lot of government uh there's something like seventeen thousand labs in our country and the vast majority are in in private industry uh you know developing drugs or and one of the things in Jersey is we have, we are the sort of the world capital of flavors and fragrances. We have all these labs, some of them are just a couple of people and they develop the new fragrances and flavors for, you know, drinks and healthcare products and on and on and on and on. So uh, we, we have a, I think I, I, that didn't answer your question, David, but uh, it's, it's, I think it's going to be more public private partnerships than, than ever before. Jim. Yeah, um, I've been particularly interested in the uh, autonomous driving vehicles. Yeah. And I'm not quite sure how many livery jobs there are in the United States. The estimate seems to be somewhere around two and a half to three million. Yeah. But it would seem to me that when we have autonomous driving, we are probably going to lose between a half and three quarters of those autonomous driving jobs, which is somewhere, let's call it two to two and a half million people. And those are reasonably well-paying jobs, everything from uh, bus drivers to uh, cab drivers to truck drivers. And I was wondering if you've given any thought to the implications of what all this uh, uh, digitization or sort of the digitization of everything means uh, about the uh, ability for people to make a living. Uh, yeah, I have, and a, a couple of uh, quick retorts. And I'll, 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 first of all, big caveat: I'm an incurable optimist, so I'm I'm the guy that sees the, the world through rose-colored glasses. Having said that, uh, right now um, there are jobs going begging in the long-haul trucking industry. Uh, people just don't want to take a job that takes them away from home and so right. forth and there. So instantaneously, we've got a, a crisis in terms of not enough people. Um, longer term, you're absolutely right, you know, whatever the numbers are, but there's going to be huge numbers of people that are going to be out of, a, out of the traditional job of sitting behind a wheel and driving down I-80 all the way to wherever Chicago or San Francisco or wherever they're going. Um, and I can't predict how that's going to shake out in terms of, of uh, you know, what the overall economy uh, uh, is all about. But I will tell you uh, a quick parable, and I think it's worth taking in, in, into account. When this country was formed, and we had the Declaration of Independence and all that kind of stuff there in the late 1700s, 98% of the jobs were in agriculture. Now, 2% of the jobs are in agriculture. And we haven't seen over that 200 and some year span any notable um, uh, people out of work or, you know, when, the, when cars replaced horses, you know, all the farriers and stable boys and, and blacksmiths, they all lost jobs. 
and buggy whip makers. I mean, and, and was somehow or another, we got through it and people now have jobs and there are jobs galore that nobody ever heard of, um, you know, website developer, uh, you know, all the software things. I mean, there are jobs galore that, that were not even heard of, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So I have faith, Jim, that, that there will be a, a job for most everybody going forward. Um, and I have some trepidations, for instance, of, you know, how many of these jobs will be just additional paperwork, make work kind of jobs, because we certainly have enough of that in things like the healthcare industry and so forth. Anyway, that's my take. Um, you know, I, 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 I know there will be changes, but in general, uh, changes will be for the good. And oh, by the way, part of the thing with the autonomous vehicles is the safety issues. Not only will we be able to, uh, you know, clean up the, 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 the uh, contact la level with respect to viruses and stuff, but, you know, we kill a million three people on the road every year in the, worldwide, and we kill about 35,000 here in the United States. Those are big numbers. Those are epidemic numbers, even not quite as big as, as COVID, but, um, you know, if we, and, you know, best guess is we're going to eliminate about 90% of the crashes when we, uh, when we go to fully autonomous vehicles. Interestingly enough, I basically agree with everything you said. <laughs> well, yeah, Neela. Uh, I think part of the problem is we humans are not taking personal responsibility in this COVID crisis. If we take personal responsibility, we can bring this to an end very quickly. People are wearing masks, but they're not covering their noses. And a lot of people are not wearing masks. So especially gentlemen, they don't like to cover their noses. It's so disgusting. They think the nose doesn't do anything. And uh, that's one thing. Another thing is there are many people who are elderly and lonely. And one of our own members was quite upset that on Rosh Hashanah, there was nobody to be with her. I took her out for a long drive and we had a beautiful lunch in, along the Hudson River in Newburgh. And I was able to cheer her up a bit. But we all should do that for each other. Hey, well, thank you, Neela. And, and back to my, um, my role in this all is, is in the technology world. And first of all, uh, taking personal responsibility it's not exactly technology, but it, it's, it's in the technology world, and that is developing the communication, developing the meth message. You know, this is public health issues, and, and we, we've, over the, you know, last 150 years, we've developed public health m messages that convinced us to spend all the money on clean water, clean, on sewers, on a whole lot of other public health issues so that we all live about twice as long as we that we used to, uh, why we're not taking personal responsibility for the masks and the social distancing. Um, you know, all I can say is, is that uh, I think we've blown the, uh, the, the, the messaging because uh, we've got an inconsistent messaging, at least here in the United States. As to the lonely and the elderly, uh, both this organization and the Summit Old Guard, we're doing this and people are, um, you know, chiming in and, and signing on and uh, you know it, it takes some amount of tutorials from uh, the technology haves and the technology have not so people that just don't understand how to how to hook up a zoom connection to get them used to it so there's a technology issue um, that said um, you know connectivity with your neighbors and friends um, this is, uh, by the way, an official declared disaster in the United States, and I guess worldwide. You know, this is a disaster. It's a lot different than most disasters, like, the, like say, Hurricane Sandy. This one's slow rolling. We're still in the response phase. We've not even really gotten into recovery and in the parlance of, of, of disaster management. The... Uh, the key in, in disaster management or a key is taking care of your neighborhood. And, you know, in, in Sandy, we had people and at least uh, one person died in Summit from going down into a basement uh, and, and 
I forget if they got electrocuted or they drowned in, you know, with the, with the power out. We had a lot of those in the in New Jersey, New York area of people that just did stupid stuff and they were older. And if, if the neighbors had been there to help them out with, uh, say, a headlamp or, you know, somebody who's 20 years old going down into the basement instead of somebody who's 80 years old, all the difference in the world. So uh, helping out neighbors is a huge key component of any disaster. And like I said, this is a disaster, Neela. We know it. And taking care of, of neighbors uh, and doing something, I don't want to trivialize this, simple, like, you know, taking a person out for a, a ride can make all the difference in the world. And, and we all need to do those kind of things. And, and we all need to uh, be mindful of, of relatives uh, and neighbors who, who need help. And a lot of times, like you said, it's not a big help that they need. Um, other comments, questions? Um, I, I'd like to say on behalf of, uh, of the Rotarians, your presentation was really informative, helpful, and enlightening. And I think we, we all, I'd like our members to join in saying uh, a hearty thank you for this wonderful presentation.